If you have your Bibles, we're in Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. How many of you know that God is not absent in our lives, right? He doesn't, he doesn't just save us and then leave us out there to do the best that we can. He doesn't, he doesn't you know, just you know, save us and then just shove us out into the cold, cruel world and say, all right, I saved you, now you're good, right? God doesn't do that, does he? They think, uh, oftentimes, I think that you know, people think that maybe that's how God looks at us, that God saves us and he says, okay, now you're on your own. God, God uh, never does that. We know that obviously God's word says that he will never leave us, he will never forsake us, right? He's not going to do that. Actually, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 8, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, it says this. Uh, it, it says that I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Okay? And so we see these things, you know, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, where it says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee or anything else. But oftentimes, like I said, we, I think that we think that God is, that once he saves us, that he just leaves us. That he doesn't... That he, you know, that, that he's like, okay, I saved you, I did my part, now you can just do whatever you want. Or that he just leaves us alone, right? And so in, in Acts chapter 7, verse, verses 47 through 49, I want to read these verses. It says, But Solomon built him a house. How be it, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool, what house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that, Lord, you would give us ears to, uh, ears to hear your word, and that we'd also be doers of the word as well. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit, God, that you would speak through me, and that you would use me for your honor and for your glory. And God, I pray that Lord, that every single person in this room would know beyond a shadow of a doubt, Lord, that you will never leave them nor forsake them, that you are with them always in Jesus' name. Amen. A quick uh, a little reminder also, uh, as my wife said, is the annual business meeting that we have. Uh, we're going to have right after service, uh, right after service we're going to have uh, lunch, and then after lunch, we're going to have our annual business meeting. But tonight, uh, tonight's service, as far as uh, you know, first youth and uh, you know, prayer meeting, we are going to cancel those services because it's already been, you know, it's already going to be a long day with you know the lunch and with have, uh, with having the annual business meeting. So, just wanted to let you guys know that you know beforehand. That that's an announcement that I almost forgot. Um, so I don't want, you know, just want to let you guys know that that way you don't show up tonight and wonder where everybody is, as well. So, like I said. This morning, I want to talk to you for a few moments about how to practice the presence of God. How to practice the presence of God. Because some of you will say, well, well, Pastor, you started talking about the fact of that God's never going to leave us nor forsake us and everything else. Then you start talking, then you, start, you pick a, a portion of Scripture that talks about building a house and everything else and that, you know, building a house of God and all these other things. Well, you know what? One of the things I want us to realize is that both go hand in hand. Building a, you know, building a house for God and the fact of that God's never going to leave you nor forsake you, they go hand in hand. That God is ever with his children. We are never out of his presence. I want to, you know, like I said, I want to speak about the matter of God's presence in an attempt to clear up some confusion that there may be on the matter of how we practice the presence of God. Because oftentimes, when I hear somebody say, I've heard people many a times, whether in this in the, in the foyer out here in the church or in, actually in the, in the sanctuary or auditorium or wherever you want to call this place, they will sit there and they will say, I, can't, I want to talk to you about something, but I can't say it here. And I'm like, why can't you say it? Well, this is the church house. This is, for all you know, intensive, uh, intensive purposes, this is a building. Okay. Don't get, don't get me wrong, don't you know, th think that I'm like ungrateful for, you know, for this great building. I think it's an amazing building, but this is a building. When it all comes down to, you know, uh, to everything else, when everything is tried by fire and everything else, this building will go up in fire. But this building won't. So when we ask the question, where does God live? Some would say, well, the church, because... We call the church the house of God, right? 
but God doesn't have his address at this church. David tells us in Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12, that God is everywhere all at once. Now think about that. Everywhere all at once. You say, well, okay, that's upon the earth, that's upon the universe. He's also, you know, God's all, you know, I'm going to blow your minds just in this first five minutes of my sermon. God is also in hell. Because if you read Psalm 139, it says that, you know, where can I go? Can I go down to hell? And I'm out of God's presence? No. God's there. His presence is there. But obviously there are people being tormented and everything else in hell. God is everywhere. Yet God does also have a house. In fact, he has possessed several through, uh, throughout the ages. Today I want to help you to practice the presence of God. I want every one of us to be able to know and to enjoy the sweet, abiding presence minute by minute as we travel through life. To be able to practice His presence or live in the reality of His presence, you must first know where He is. Allow me to share with you this truth. God has made and used four different houses and how each one fits into God's plan will help us to be able to experience the joy of His awesome presence. Now, in each of these, each of these four houses, there's going to be four different aspects that you're going to see that I'm going to hit on every one. One is the design. The other one's going to be the desecration, then the desolation, and then the destruction. God's first primary house The first place where God dwells, is he chose to dwell, was in Adam. The design design for this is that Adam was a three-part house. He was made in the image of Almighty God, right? Because the Bible says that, let us make man in our image. So, in that fact, he reflected the triune nature of God. 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verse 23 says this, And the very, God of peace, uh, uh, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, uh, God, I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What do we see in this, you know, in this portion of Scripture? It says what? That there's a spirit, there's a soul, and there's a body. Okay? Remember, God breathed into God. Uh, sorry, God breathed into Adam his primary design. Right, body, soul, and spirit. The body allows access to the physical world. Right, because we have a body, we can access the physical world. We can go around touching stuff. Right. The the soul allows access to the emotional world. Our soul is what you know brings around you know, upon different emotions and everything else. The spirit allows access to the spiritual world right? What part of this is not alive when you're a heathen? Is your spirit. Because you must be born again, right? The spirit is what separates man from animals. This is why I'm able to sit there and and make the, the statement in the comment that, I'm sorry, not all dogs go to heaven. Or cats or different animals. Why? Because, because we have a spirit animals don't. It makes us unique because the Spirit can be indwelled by, uh, by God, and it is uh, the Spirit where we have the capacity to worship God. That's, that's why when we are born again, that's what happens. Here's the, uh, the desecration, is Adam's sin. Adam's sin, when Adam sinned, he died not only physically but spiritually. Remember, Adam lived... He was going to live forever, but because he sinned, and he not only died spiritually, but also physically, he only lived to be 930 years old. And we could sit there and say, well, 930 years old, I mean, that's a long time. I mean, what do you get somebody for their wedding anniversary on their 300th year? I mean, I know like on the 50th, it's supposed to be like gold and stuff like that. I mean, what do you, I don't know, what a mansion by that time? I, I don't know what you get. But think about it, Adam's sin defiled the house and God moved out. God's, God will not abide in a dirty house. Because of that, there was desolation. 
The desolation is that after Adam sinned and God moved out, Adam's house became desolate. And when I say Adam, it's not that one. But I saw some of you look that way. In other words, the fact of, of his death became evident. He was separated from God. What did God do when Adam sinned? He kicked him out of the Garden of Eden. They were separated in that way. He began, uh, began to suffer under the curse. Because of Adam's sin and him allowing that, that's the reason why we have sickness and disease and we have pain and suffering and all those things, right? When his spirit died, his soul took over. Man from that day, uh, from that day to this has lived as he pleases. That's the reason why you see people go out in the world and do whatever they want to do. Why? It's because their spirit is dead, but they're living through their soul. This is also referred to as the natural man. The natural man is, is led by his, his soul because apart from God, the spirit of man is dead. Literally, the house was led, uh, left desolate. What does that word desolate mean? Barren, bare. There was nothing there. And think about, uh, think about it this way. We just had Christmas a few, mo- uh, a few months ago, right? We celebrated Christmas. A live Christmas tree does what? It, it's alive, right? But when it is cut down, it is dead. Make sense? It, can ma- uh, it will retain the look for, of life for a while, but as, as sure as a few weeks have passed, the truth of his death will be evident. We will bring that tree home, we'll, we'll decorate it, we'll put all kinds of things on there, and what begins to happen almost immediately, because that tree has been cut off, all the pine needles are on the floor. Hopefully you get one that's still mostly alive, or, well, as alive as it can be when it's cut off. Because there's been a lot, you know, many a times where I've seen a Christmas tree almost look like Charlie Brown's Christmas tree, you know, within a matter of a day or so because all the needles fell off. The same is true of the human house that is empty of God. They will look alive, but eventually you will begin to see the death that's in their life. And this brings about destruction. Eventually, Adam died physically, like I said, he only lived to be 930 years. You say, that's, that's still quite a bit of time. But after a while, God, you know, uh, God uh, you know, put a, a timer on it and said, you're not going to live past this amount of years. And that was 100, I believe it was 130 years. He said that you know, nobody's going to be able to live beyond that. I think you're 120, 130. I'm, be, I'm, I'm between the two in my mind. And some people say, well, why would you want to live that long anyways? But every single day, I know obviously that's a blessing to us. The house he lived in was destroyed and returned to the elements from which it came. We know that obviously that Adam was created out of the dust of the ground and God breathed into him and then all that. But the thing is, is that what ended up happening from that point was is that he died and he returned back to that state. And that same end awaits every one of us here today. You say, well, pastor... This message is just getting more and more edifying as you go out, just building me up right now. I mean, think about it. Death is literally stalking at each and every single one of us. The one question you know, that you have to ask is, like, are you prepared? This is the true picture of everyone who is without God. Everyone who is without God is they have this house, right? They have body, soul, and spirit. Yes, they still have a spirit, but is, the spirit is dead. So they're going to live whatever way they want to. The second house is this, God's pattern house. This would be the temple, the physical temple that they used to have. It served as a visual pattern for mankind so that man could see the type of dwelling God would use. As I talked to you a little bit about last week on a little tangent that I went off on, is that the temple was always, the temple sacrifices and all that was always a foreshadowing of what needed to take place for us. But the Bible says that, that it's always, for salvation, it's always been believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. The design you know, for this one, 
this house was made of three rooms. They had the outer court, the inner court, and the innermost court. In its design, it, correspond, it corresponds to each of us. The outer court is the human body. This is the place of sacrifice. Like it says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says that this is your spiritual act of worship, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. The inner court is the human soul. That's the place of gathering and the hearing of the word, the place of, of reason and understanding. And the innermost court is the place where the priest met with God, the place of worship and personal communion, uh, communication with God. We can see these different aspects in our life. That's, that's God's design on those areas. But what happened? What was the desecration or, the, or, or, or what happened? Through idolatry and sin, Israel desecrated and defiled the temple. That's the reason why the temple was destroyed twice. God, because of that, God moved out. And we can see this because Jesus talks about it in Matthew chapter 21, verse 13, that says, It is, writ uh, it is written, My house uh, shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And because of that, desolation took place. The people uh, still carried out all the ancient rituals. They kept on doing all those things. But sadly, the thing was, is they did, they did not realize that God was gone. They still went to the temple, they still sacrificed and everything else, until God finally destroyed it. But up until that point, God knew that what they were doing through idolatry, which is you know, having statues and all that kind of, holding something in higher regard than what you have God. You put God kind of like down here and you're like, whatever this is, I want, I want to worship that, I want to follow that, and God's over here. And they didn't realize that God had left, that God was gone. And you know what? Here's the even sadder part about it. They didn't even notice. Many churches are in the same situation right now, that the glory of the Lord has left. They do all the, uh, all the rituals and everything else, but there's no, uh, there, none of the glory. 1 Samuel, uh, Samuel chapter 4, verse 21 says declares this, Ichabod, meaning what? The glory has left. Matthew 23, verse uh, 38 says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. That right there brought about destruction, as I spoke of earlier, that the temple was destroyed in 70 AD because it was unfit to be inhabited by God. I like, I like Matthew 24, verses 1 and 2, because this shows that what, what the Jewish people over in Israel are doing when they're bowing down to the wall that they say is the wall of the original temple is not it. You say, well, how is that possible? You know, and I'm not going to do what I did before because uh, I had a, well, there's other ones that were laughing when I did it. But, you know, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's the Jewish people that have the Okay, I'm not going to say it, because it's the only way I can describe it, all right, is you have the little curly cues with a little hat on, and they're over there bobbing and weaving, going like this, at that wall, and they're putting all their things, but that's not the Temple Mount. They say, that's the Temple Mount. No, it's not. You say, Pastor, how do you know that definitively? Because God's Word says that it's not. Matthew 24, verses 1 and 2 says this, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came uh, to him. For to show him the buildings of the temple, and Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall no, uh, not be left here one stone upon another that shall, not be uh, that, that shall not be thrown down. What does God's word say? That not one stone is going to be put upon another. If you have a wall, there are stones upon another. So that's how I know that that's not the true place of the Temple Mount. That's a, that's a side note uh, uh, to whatever, you know, all the stuff I'm talking about, but you, we need to realize God's word is true. When he says these things, God is not making this stuff up. That stuff was destroyed. What that place is believed now, you know, there was a, a former fort called Fort Antonio. Not your fort. 
And that's what they're bowing down to. Not the Temple Mount. And by, by the way, when did God's word ever say that you're supposed to bob down, uh, you know, bob in, in whatever to a wall or to a building? God's word never tells you to do that. But that's what they do. But I digress. Let's go back to you know, the actual sermon. The third house is this, God's perfect house. And this was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ obviously is the perfect house. We see the design that, you know, uh, that is talked about that, you know, that he is the word, th- that he came in, uh, in his own body, which was a temple, that in uh, John chapter uh, 2, verse 19, you know, that, his, uh, that his house was indwelled by the Spirit, that in Matthew uh, 6, uh, 16 and 17, it says this, it says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight, up out of the, uh, straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit descending like a dove, lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven, saying, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. We realize that obviously that he is, that he was God incarnate, and that he will always be that. This temple was designed to be the place of perfect sacrifice. Side note on this verse, do you not see the, three, uh, the triune God in, uh, in those verses, in those two verses? I know, there's, I know there's churches out there that, you know, that teach you know, that, that, uh, that the, the Trinity is false and it's fake, but how do you not see it in those two verses? It says, so we have, let's go, I want to go back to the verse. And when Jesus, when he was baptized, so Jesus is there, right? Went up straight out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God. So wouldn't that be the Holy Spirit? And lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven said, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. So if this is his son, who is that in heaven? The Father. Do you not have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit just mentioned in these two verses? And yet, we're, uh, you know, yet because we believe in, in the Trinity, the Trinity, well, the Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible, but it's all throughout the Bible. They use the word Trinity, why? Because of the fact that it represents what the Bible teaches. The word rapture is not in the Bible either, but yet we talk about the rapture all the time too, right? Because the Bible talks about being caught up. Those same people that say that, you know, uh, that we're wrong on the Trinity believe in the rapture, and they will use that word, even though it's not in the Bible. Again, I'm going to go back to what I was originally talking about. The desecration, the temple was desecrated as no one, as no other has ever been. We know that the temple, of God, the temple of Jesus Christ, you know, when he was upon this earth, was desecrated. Literally all the sins of humanity were placed on him. All the sins. How can you get more, how can you desecrate a temple more than placing all the sins, all of our, all of our you know, wickedness and all the evil things that we've done and everything upon one man? By the way, he is 100% God and 100% man. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse twenty one says this For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Do we not understand that that God placed your sin, my sin, upon Jesus Christ because we're not good enough? We were never good enough. The sin in our life had caused separation with God. What does God do? He does, he does what? He sends his son to die, in which in that time, he places all the sin upon him as a perfect sacrifice. Why? Because he is perfect, and we are not. I know that some, you know, there may be some that either you know, uh, here this morning or watching online that may think, I am perfect. No, you're not. I hate to burst your bubble. Actually, no, I don't hate to burst your bubble. I want to tell you the truth. You're not perfect. But he is. And God placed all sin upon him that we might be saved. Why do you say might? Because not everybody receives that gift. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6 says this. All 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and God hath laid upon him, what? The iniquity of us all. That would be sin. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. Do you know how you're healed? He saved you. You were broken, and he saved you. The desolation is this. When, uh, when Christ became sin on Calvary, he was abandoned by God the Father. You say, well, how's that possible? He's God. I don't know. But Romans chapter 8, verse 32 says this. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, he, uh, how shall he not with him also freely give, uh, give us all things? Matthew chapter uh, 27, verse tw uh, 24. I don't actually have that in my notes, so let's, let's go look at it. Matthew 27, verse 46. And it says, And, and about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama uh, uh, sab uh, sabatini. That is uh, to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The darling Son of God became the object of the Father's loathing, and God judged the Son in our place. Do we realize that? That God judged his own Son in our place. Because why? Because Jesus was willing to do it. Jesus was left desolate, and he died alone. Here's another thing that I've talked about, you know, uh, in the past, but I want to talk to you. Do you not realize that Jesus, when he, and, and this is, I know you're like, this is not Easter. It's coming. But do you, not, do you not realize that when Jesus laid in the tomb, his body laid, he wasn't just doing nothing for three days and three nights. The Bible says that he literally went down to hell. Why? Because he had to get the keys from hell and the grave. He had to also, he had to make, he had to make uh, the ultimate sacrifice. This is why when you read the book of Leviticus, do you ever notice that when you read the book of Leviticus, all the offerings that are brought upon the altar are burnt offerings? Jesus is the ultimate burnt offering. He took all of our sins. He didn't just, you know, all of a sudden, like, he died upon the cross, and then that was it, and he laid in the tomb, and then all of a sudden, boop, just came up. Out. People say, well, what did he do for three days? I just told you. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 27. What does it say? Because uh, thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. This is him speaking of, of Jesus. Neither wilt thou uh, leave, or wilt thou... Uh, yeah, wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption? Thou hast made uh, known to me the, the ways of life. Thou hast made uh, known, or make me full of joy with thy countenance. When we read these things, and I, you know, honestly, that's, it's, it's not, in my, uh, in not, not in my notes, but the thing is, is that The Bible speaks of it. Sorry, there it is, verse 31. I just found it. Sorry, verse 31. He's seen this before spank of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul will not be left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus God hath raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Right there uh, in the Bible, it talks about, and over and over again, it talks about this. Over and over again, that he did these things.
God took our sin, placed it upon him, and he died alone because of it. What ended up happening? The destruction. Like the first Adam, the second Adam, Jesus was destroyed. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10 says, Yet it pleased the Lord, uh, pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath uh, put him to grief. When thou uh, shalt make his soul an offering for his sin, for sin, he, uh, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the uh, pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. What does the Bible say? That when he, when he was destroyed, what did it do? It says that he, it pleased the Lord to do it. Why? Because he knew the outcome. Jesus died to take away the penalty of sins, of our sins, that that perfect house, like all the previous ones, were destroyed. And he suffered for us all. Why? So that way we could have a permanent house. Number four, God's permanent house. Here's where the pattern obviously changes, that God has stopped moving. God has taken up residence in a permanent dwelling, and that dwelling is you and I. The design in John uh, 14, 16, it says, And I will pray the, Father, uh, pray the Father, and he shall give you another, that he, uh, that he may abide with you forever. The believer has been reconstructed and made a fit dwelling for the Almighty God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which uh, ye have of, of God, and uh, ye know... Uh, and you are not your own, for ye are brought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. So we went from the, uh, those three different ones, right, into the permanent house, which is you and I. That God, when you, get sa- uh, when you get saved or when you got saved, he reconstructed it to make it a permanent dwelling for him. So what's the, you know, say, well, pastor, what's the, what's the desecration in this? How has it been defiled? How has it been desecrated? This house cannot be desecrated. It cannot be. We are sealed. This is a holy area that, that, has been, uh, that has been sealed off that no one gets in or no one gets out. We are sealed with a promise. But what about sin, you, uh, you may ask? When you trust Jesus Christ, all sin is removed. Do we not realize that? When you've trusted in Jesus Christ, all sin has been removed. Past, present, and future sin. And some say, well, wait, wait, wait. Even the sin that I'm going to, you know, like if the Lord should tarry and I live tomorrow or next week or next month or next year is forgiven? Yes. You say, well, pastor, aren't you just kind of like pulling that out of nowhere? Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14 says this. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was, uh, that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. I don't know about you, that, that should make you excited. Because some people say, well, yes, I understand my present sin and my past sin or whatever, but the Bible says all your transgresses have been forgiven when you have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Past, present, and future. Sin is no longer credited to us, but rather we enjoy the imputed righteousness of God. Romans chapter 4, verses 22 uh, through 24. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of the... Uh, oh, wait, I just read that one. That's Colossians. Romans chapter 4, uh, 4, verse 22 through 24. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not uh, written for, uh, for his sake alone, that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to uh, whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him, what is that? If we believe on him as what? When we get saved, right? Because we've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, right? When we, uh, if we believe on him that, uh, that raised, uh, raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. So he says, you know what? When you do that, 
your sin is no longer imputed to you. It's actually imputed to Christ. Because why? Because it's his righteousness that we get. And he already paid the payment for our sin. Amen? You say, well, Pastor, then what about the desolation? This house can never be left desolate. God cannot depart. He's never going to leave you or forsake you. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. He says that even if you do believe not, what he did, he was still faithful. Because some people say, well, it can't be for every man. This would be like the Calvinist out there that says that God only died for the elect, for those that would get saved. No, the Bible says that he died for all. The entire world. And what does it say? Uh, what does it say? He says, you know what? If that were true, if Jesus Christ only died for the elect, for, for Christians, for believers, he would deny himself. And he can't do that. Jesus Christ died for all, but not all will believe. The true believer is God's house and will be forever, eternally saved and eternally sealed. Let's look at Ephesians 4.30. It says this, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. How long are you sealed for? Until he comes back. And when, then where are you going to be? In heaven for all of eternity. He says, you are sealed until that day. How do you practice the presence of God? He's with you every single day. Remember that. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. He's not going to unseal you. Why? Because you are sealed unto the day of redemption. That's his promise to you. We don't need the... Uh, <laughs> We don't need the first two houses. We need the third house, Jesus Christ. And what he says, you know what, you, uh, you have believed upon that house, Jesus Christ. He says, you're not going to need another house because you're the permanent residence. Where's the destruction? This house can't be destroyed. God has promised us eternal life through Jesus Christ. This house can never be destroyed. You say, well, yes, pastor, this body. I'm not talking about this body. Your body, your body is going to you know, fall away, but your spirit it will live forever. God has promised eternal life. And when he says that, when we die and this old body just falls apart, in which sometimes I sit there and say, Pat, I say to myself, I say, you know what? I don't know how much longer this body you know, is going to keep going. But every single day that I have that I'm able to preach, I want to preach the gospel. I want to preach so people can get saved. Amen? Because you know what? God has not promised me tomorrow. God has not promised us tomorrow. But God has promised us eternal life through Jesus Christ. John chapter 10, verse 28, you say, well, yeah, I, I don't know if I, if I believe that I can never lose it. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Who is saying that? Jesus Christ. If we don't want to believe that, you know, that that's possible, that we can never lose it, then you're calling Jesus a liar. Jesus himself said what? That Neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. Does that mean that you can do it? Because th this is the argument that I heard. Well, not any man, but I can do it. Where is that in the Bible? It doesn't say it. It says any man. That includes you. No person is able to take you out of the Father's hand. No one. This doesn't mean that God won't clean house every now and then. We need to be able to, you say, what do you mean clean house? The Bible says, if we sin, the Bible knows that you will sin, that you're going to need a house cleaning. And if you leave it dirty and desolate, what ends up happening to you? It's amazing 
The more you take care of something, the longer it lasts. But the, the least amount you know, that you take care of, you say, you know, I'm just going to leave it over. You know what? Despite what evolutionary uh, scientists you know, teach, houses never get better as they sit and rot. They never get better. My, my truck is a 2008. You know what? Lo and behold, the rust is coming. It's not going away. But I, like I said, every now and then, he will have to do some house cleaning. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Get rid of that sin. Keep that house clean. Be OCD about your sin. Get rid of it. Some people say, well, you know what? OCD people, they just, you know, they just want everything in a particular or whatever. When it comes to your Christian life, you better be OCD. Because the longer you leave sin, the worse and worse your house is going to get. But when he does, here's the thing. When he cleans house, he doesn't move out. The Christian will never fear hell. You don't have, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you never have to fear hell. John chapter 5, verse 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believe on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. The believer never has to worry about hell. Never. So here are a few lessons that we should consider. Number one is this, salvation. Salvation isn't about getting man into heaven. It is about getting God into man. It is about making dead men live. It is about living for God and doing his will as opposed to the will of the world or of the devil. Number two, Security. God has stopped moving. God has stopped moving. He is not moving out of your house. I know, I know that I am eternally secure today because he has promised to stay forever. The Bible says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Adam fell and God moved out. He has moved into us to stay. Number three, sanctification. When Adam sinned, he died immediately in the spirit, progressively in the soul, and ultimately in the body. We are justified at, at the instant of salvation. That means we are made right, we are justified before God as soon as we have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and sanctified progressively in the soul and glorified ultimately in the body. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says this, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. You know what that day is? When the redemption, our redemption comes. We are sealed, right? And he's going to continue to work on us until he comes back. Do you know why it stops when he comes back? It's because you're given a new body. Just like that song, he's still working on me. We can sing that song all the way up until the day he comes back because then you know what? Then he's going to give us a new body. We don't have to be worked on anymore. God isn't finished with you yet. He isn't finished with you yet. We aren't perfect because he likes fixer-uppers. He is rebuilding, remaking, remodeling you into the image of Jesus Christ. He is remodeling and rebuilding and, re, uh, and remaking me into his image as well. Number four, spirituality. Jesus lives in you. Don't just dress up on Sunday and pretend to meet him, on, uh, meet him in the church. He is with you all the time, everywhere you go. Therefore, every action in our life should reflect this truth. You are God's temple, and because of this truth, every day is a holy day. Every place is a holy place.
And the fifth lesson to consider is service. Do not insult God by saying that he cannot use you. Do not insult God by saying that he cannot use you. I've heard deacons say this, not here. I've heard church members, not here. But I've heard people say, you know what? I've hit this age, and you know what? I think I'm done. I think I'm going to let somebody else do it. I don't have to do that anymore. I put in my time. God isn't done with you yet. If you're breathing, he can use you. It doesn't matter whether, uh, whether when you walk, if you have a limp, or you say, you know what, I can't get up out of bed. It doesn't matter any of those things because, you know what, if you're breathing, if you have words, you can speak the gospel to somebody. You say, you know what, I can't speak anymore. Write it down. If you say, you know what, I can't, I can't speak, I don't have my... There's other ways you could do it. Give somebody, you know, give somebody something. But the thing is, is that if you're alive and breathing and kicking, God can use you and will use you. He lives in you, and as you continually yield to him and constantly depend on him, he will use you. Why? Because you are his temple, and he wants you to be used for his glory. So what kind of shape is, that, uh, is God's house in today? What, what type of shape is God's house in? You know that I'm not talking about this house. I'm talking about this house. I'm talking about that house. What kind of shape is it in today? You say, well, you know what? Don't feel too good. I've been, I've been sick. Now, what kind of shape is it in spiritually? Today would be a good day to begin a home improvement project, wouldn't it? For some of us in this place, for all of us in this place, we all have to do home improvement. Because, like I say, if we don't do home improvement, what ends up happening? The house is going to fall apart. Are you willing to be all that God wants you to be? Are you willing to be the temple of the Lord that the Lord can use? And say, Lord, you know what? It's not about me, but it's about you. What's that going to look like for some people? It's going to, be look, uh, it's going to look like getting up earlier. Why? Because you want to read God's word. You want to pray. You want to sing songs of pra- uh, praise to him. Don't miss out on the fact of prayer. Because we can read God's word, we can you know, follow God's word, which is a good thing. I'm not saying that. But oftentimes you say, you know what, well, pff, I, I put in five minutes of, of reading the Bible. I don't have any time to pray. Well, think about this. God's word is seed, right? How does he water it? I think he waters it through prayer. He brings the increase, right? And when you begin to talk to God, what ends up happening? He begins to water his word, and you have growth. Don't forget prayer. Don't forget it. Over the next few moments, I want you to begin to ask God, what areas in my life need home improvement? What areas do I need to come up? And if you say, you know what, I don't think I could be used, I want you to begin to ask God, how can you use me?